final presentation of today is going to be by Dr. Jordan Cooper on Weiner's Theological Anthropology. Uh, Dr. Jordan Cooper is Professor of Systematic Theology, Executive Director of Justin Center Publishing and Podcast, President of the American Lutheran Theological Seminary, and has authored several books, Liturgical Worship, Hands of Faith, Baptized into Christ, Crucifixion, and we use a lot of those in our college and seminary. We're thankful for uh, the work of Dr. Cooper and welcome him today as he presents and wraps up our Lutheran studies. Please join me welcoming Dr. Cooper. Well, there's a, a negative and a positive to going last. The negative is that you've all been sitting and listening for a while and you may be spacing out during my talk. Uh, but the positive for me uh, is that there's no one coming after me, so I can talk as long as I want. <laughs> Uh, no, but my, my presentation is um, maybe a, a little longer than it should be. I'll try to cut out some things to keep it at the right length. But for that reason, I'm probably not going to take questions. Um, but I'm happy to answer any of your questions afterwards. Well, the, the title of the talk here in the program is just Widener's Anthropology. And uh, to be clear, uh, the, the actual real topic of, of the talk here is trying to move forward in new directions in theological anthropology in a way that is faithfully, confessionally Lutheran, and we're using Widener, Revere Franklin Widener, as kind of a guide to doing that. Well, it would not be accurate to say that the classical Lutheran dogmatics in the immediate post-Reformation era ignored theological anthropology entirely. The topic was not among the central concerns of Lutheran academicians in the 16th and 17th centuries. As theology often forms in response to particular claims being contended for, the problems of post-enlightenment materialism, post-structuralism, and post-modernity had not yet forced theologians to contend for basic theological and philosophical claims about man, which they took for granted. These current challenges include the questioning of the sex binary, the existence of the soul, the denial of there being such a thing as human nature at all. In light of these current challenges, some have attempted to move beyond older theological anthropological models, as these older approaches are criticized for being too rooted in Hellenistic categories to be relevant to the modern milieu. It might thus seem, perhaps, that we are left either to remain within the theological debates of the 17th century, and thus remaining basically irrelevant to current discourse, or to adopt some other metaphysical system by which man is to be explained that is not so beholden to classical philosophy. In opposition to this dichotomy, I contend for an alternative, which is rooted in the theology of Lutheran orthodoxy, while recognizing the need to develop and move forward. Confessional Lutheran theology, when done rightly, is more than a mere repetition of older formulas. The completion of the Book of Concord in 1580 was not the telos of theological history, never to be expanded in any way. Rather, the Lutheran confessions stand as the basis upon which further theological development is to be grounded. Issues such as the nature of biblical inspiration, women's ordination to the pastoral office, and the creational distinction between the sexes do not have any extensive treatment in any of the confessional documents. And when these issues have arisen since, the response, at least among confessional Lutherans, was not to abandon the confessions, nor to simply leave the question unanswered, but instead to develop a robust theological position on the basis of the theological ideas set forth within our earlier tradition. Though in many areas of theological writing from Lutheran authors, such an approach has been followed, with regard to the nature of man, such has often not been the case. In contradistinction to the strongly Aristotelian view of humankind, as set forth in the first article of the Formula of Concord, against the Neo-Manichaean teachings of Matthias Flaccius, some modern Lutheran scholars have argued for competing linguistic and relational anthropological models. To be clear, this is not a mere addition to the essentialist formulations of the Lutheran confessions for these authors, but is at times explicitly formulated in contrast to metaphysical realism. Just as one example, in their book, The Lutheran Confessions, History and Theology of the Book of Concord, Aaron Kolb and Nessigan criticized the formula of Concord's adoption of Aristotelian categories of substance and accidental properties as a, quote, swamp, which is fatal as it relies on an alien paradigm. In their view, scripture, on, scripture operates on, quote, an entirely different metaphysical framework. It is difficult to reconcile adherence to a quia confessional subscription 
While one simultaneously denies the philosophical framework, which the formula explicitly affirms as, quote, indisputable, one might be some kind of Lutheran while denying essentialist metaphysics, but it's hard to be a confessional one. This paper makes the case for a contemporary theological anthropology that is rooted in the scholastic realism as adopted by the formula of Concord, along with then the Lutheran Orthodox writers of the 17th century. Though having its grounding in these formulations, this anthropology is developed in further directions in order to address current challenges. As a guide to these challenges, I am following the writings of Revere Franklin Widener, who in the early 20th century both reiterated the teachings of the Lutheran scholastics and incorporated insights from the then current developments in biblical scholarship. Throughout this work, he provides rigorous responses to the challenges of philosophical materialism in a post-Darwinian world. With Widener's synthesis, I contend that the church will find a path between the scala of mere repristination and the charybdis of theological novelty. This paper follows a threefold structure. First, the foundations of theological anthropology, as set forth among the Lutheran Orthodox writers, are set forth as a basis from which to further develop the discipline. Second, the anthropology of Revere Franklin Widener is explained in relation to these older formulations as an example of continued reflection on confessional theology as well as an expansion of it. Third, in a brief concluding section, this need for further development of Lutheran theological anthropology is addressed with an explanation of the primary anthropological questions which need to be answered in the modern academy. In classical Lutheran dogmatics, theological anthropology comprises three primary subjects. The nature of the Imago Dei, the relationship between body, soul, and spirit, and then the effects of the fall upon human nature. Further, in general, these subjects are discussed in light of humanity's fourfold state as a standard within the Augustinian tradition. In other words, the emphasis in this older theological anthropology is not so much providing a clear definition of humanity as such, though some of the later 17th century dogmaticians do this a little bit, such as David Hollatz and Abraham Koloff, but of expressing the impact of the fall and redemption on man and woman. While any number of Lutheran Orthodox thinkers could have been chosen here uh, to use as resources, I have simply chosen to use Heinrich Schmidt's often utilized doctrinal theology of the Evangelical Lutheran Church as a primary text as he compiles and summarizes the teachings of the 17th century Lutheran Orthodox theologians. We start with looking at the state of integrity, as he outlines it. Rather than including a separate chapter on anthropology as a distinctive locus, Schmid divides his exposition of humanity into two headings. First is the state of integrity, and the second is the state of corruption. The focus here is clearly economic rather than ontological. For Schmidt, theological anthropology differs significantly from philosophical anthropology. As the former explains, quote, the condition in which man now is and because of which he needs redemption. Since theology as a discipline is aimed at the telos of eternal salvation, it need not address the entirety of the fields of sociology, psychology, or biology as they all relate to man and woman. Gwenstedt writes regarding theological anthropology, quote, the discussion here is not of man to his essence, but in regard to his state, which before the fall was innocent and most happy, but after the fall, corrupt and most miserable. For Schmid, even the description of humanity in its original prelapsarian state is a mere precursor to the primary field of discussion, and that is sinful humanity and the nature of redemption. As Schmidt writes, the state of integrity is a necessary element of discussion because, quote, man's present moral condition cannot be described without first explaining how it came to be. We then begin here with a brief summary of the Lutheran Orthodox view of this prelapsarian state of humanity. The state of integrity, as Schmidt explains it, is defined by humanity's sharing in the Imago Dei in an uncorrupted manner. In this sharing of the divine image, which differentiates humanity from all other species mentioned within the creation narrative, citing Quenstedt, Schmidt contends that the nature of the image is primarily moral in nature, 
As to most of the Lutherans in the immediate post-Reformation period, Schmidt argues for a moral sense of the image based upon the New Testament texts which speak of the renewal in God's image in terms of righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3.10, Ephesians 4.24. This reality is referred to as original righteousness, which differentiates man's prelapsarian state from that of the fallen nature. Three specific elements of this original righteousness are cited by Schmid, and I'll go through these quickly. First, prelapsarian humanity had an uncorrupted intellect, which allowed him to reason perfectly. This is referred to by Bayer as a perfection of intellect, though it is not an absolute and comprehensive knowledge. Second, in the state of innocence, mankind possessed a free will with regard to spiritual things, giving the first man and woman the ability to live devoid of sin. Quenchton identifies here two distinct properties of this free will. First, he argues that the created will in its unfallen state had, quote, a neutrality, neither being good nor evil, the inclination of both was toward obedience to the Creator, though the possibility still remained for them to disobey these natural inclinations. Rather than neutrality, they are very good, as the Genesis text records. So the state of man and woman in the state of innocence was one of righteousness. However, it was not a consummate righteousness. And second, the human will was free both in the willing of the good and of man and woman's execution of that good as it arose in their wills. There are no moral hindrances that show up. There's no moral dilemma in the prelapsarian state where you'd have to choose a lesser of two evils, in other words. The good is always capable of being accomplished. Third, humanity in Eden had a purity of appetites. The affections in the prelapsarian state were aimed at the true, the good, and the beautiful. By your sights, Adam and Eve's lack of understanding of their own nakedness is evidence of this. Adam and Eve's loves were perfectly ordered so that they loved creation as its stewards. They loved one another as husband and wife, and God as the source of all things and as the highest good. Unlike the Roman Catholic formulation, the Lutheran Orthodox clearly reject any division between bodily appetites and reason, instead arguing that man as created rightly functions as a holistic being in full use of both. The affections in the state of innocence were naturally ordered in the proper proportionality as is recognized by what was unfallen reason. There is no need for some kind of extra supernatural gift, such as the donum superadditum bestowed upon human nature. As created by God, it was righteous. And then we move on to the fall and the state of humanity as we see it now in, in Lutheran orthodoxy in the post-fall era. The descriptions thus far of the original state of man within Lutheran orthodoxy explain many of the core convictions surrounding human nature as it is intended to be via creation. This, however, does not answer the more relevant question to the current age. What is humanity as it exists in the post-Lapsarian state? There is a particular difficulty in Lutheran theology here. As the focus on original righteousness as the essence of the Imago Dei could lead one to the conclusion that since original righteousness was lost in the fall, then so was human nature as such. When the theologian Matthias Flaccius began openly teaching this to be the case, with his contention that the human essence has actually become sin itself, he was rightly condemned by Article I of the Formula of Concord. It is important here then to examine some of the ways that the Lutheran Orthodox differentiate human nature from both sin and righteousness. The first point to be given here is that a distinction is made between an image and a vestige. The latter, it is argued, remains within humanity after the fall, while the former is lost. The reason for this distinction lies in a divergent set of scriptural texts which speak about the image of God within man. There are some which contend for a renewal within the divine image in regeneration and renovation, while others speak of the image of God in a broader sense, which relates to the entirety of humanity in some sense, regenerate and unregenerate alike. The two texts here, Genesis 9-6 and James 3-9. For Lutheran orthodoxy, the image of God in the more specific sense has been almost entirely lost after the fall, though these vestiges do remain. 
Though I am hesitant to disagree with the approach taken by the majority of my own theological forefathers, on this point, I do question whether the language of vestige alone is really strong enough in light of the unabashed scriptural use of Imago Dei with reference to fallen humanity and, sorry, Dr. Bierman, human dignity in Genesis 9-6 and James 3-9. In order to fully grasp what these theologians mean by vestige, the nature of the image must first be explored. In a summary of Hallatz, Teller notes three points that identify an image. First is an archetype, or the thing being imaged. Second is the ectype, or the reflective image itself. Third, there must also be some kind of agreement between the archetype and ectype. The addition of this third element clarifies that an image is more than mere resemblance. The image must actually arise forth from the archetype, rather than simply coincidentally having the qualities that coincide with it. In other words, the Imago Dei speaks not only to similarity between God and man, but also to the origin of and divine intentionality that created man. The second needed point of clarification with regard to the relationship between original righteousness and human nature is that the Imago Dei is accidental rather than substantial with regard to the human essence. There is a twofold purpose in making such a distinction. First, the image of God must be distinguished from the manner in which the Son is the image of the Father. As scripture repeatedly refers to Christ being the image of God as a unique characteristic of his own nature. This cannot be a property of other creatures. This then leads to the characterization of the Son's image as substantial, as he shares in the entire essence of the Father, and the rest of humanity's image as accidental, as it includes attributes which are indeed intimately united with the divine nature. The second purpose of this distinction is that it explains how it is that human nature can be retained if the image of God is truly lost in the fall. Even with the loss of original righteousness, quote, the being of man remains unaltered, as Schmidt summarizes. In other words, humanity still exists without original righteousness, and thus still has some kind of inherent value. Quenstedt summarizes this well. He says, we must distinguish between the substance of man, or the matter itself of which he is composed, and that which, as if something following, adheres most closely to the substance of man, or the matter itself of which he is composed, and that which, as if something following, adheres most closely to the substance of man, and nevertheless, as to its accidents, perfects it internally, or we must distinguish between nature itself and its qualities, or perfections in the qualities. The image of God indicates the latter, not the former. In short, if you didn't catch all that, here's the summary. The image of God is not man, but in man, i.e., it is not substantial or essential to man, but accidental. The image is accidental, and this also means that the fallenness of humanity is accidental, thus preserving the church against the Flackian error. Both righteousness and sin must be accidental to human nature in order for human redemption to remain a possibility. A humanity which has lost its essence is not a humanity at all, and is then cut off from Christ's assumption of that human nature. Now here is the problem. While the groundwork laid by the 17th century Lutheran Orthodox remains invaluable for contemporary Lutheran works on theological anthropology, this brief summary has made some inadequacies apparent. There is no disputing their treatment of original righteousness and its accidental nature, or of their important clarification that the Imago Dei differs significantly from the substantial sharing in the Father's nature, which is true only of the Son <coughs> and the Spirit. However, the notion of certain vestiges which remain after the fall is left underdeveloped. When examining the dogmatics texts in this era, or many later ones, such as Pieper's Christian Dogmatics, Statements about vestiges or of a broader sense of the image of God, one that has not been lost by the fall, are very brief and often appear as really just a mere acknowledgement that we have to say it simply because the text says it, so we have to acknowledge it and then move on. <coughs> Especially in light of the current challenges that our world and our culture is facing, uh, proposed in a variety of fields of academia and then as moderated into the culture through the media, I contend that this cursory treatment is simply not enough. 
the two primary texts that are cited uh, for this broader image of God, Genesis 9, 6 and, and James 3, 9, reading them in context simply does not make sense of the idea that this could only be a reference, say, to something like the moral image of God. It seems that uh, there is something far broader and more relevant to the proper functioning of the world here. So, uh, the context of the Genesis text in particular, we'll look at that first, merits some mentioning, as it is not a mere passing reference to some small vestiges of the image. Rather, the image of God serves as the basis for humanity's value. This text arises following the Noahic Flood, uh, this Noahic Flood where you have a kind of recreation of the earth, and as that happens, God reiterates and expands the creational mandate that God first gave to Adam in the garden. As Adam was told to have dominion over the earth, so was Noah told to multiply his descendants and demonstrate his authority over the earth through the eating of animals. A distinction is then made between taking the life of an animal, which is allowable for food, and doing the same to a fellow human being. While the former is permitted, the latter is profoundly evil. It is for this reason that God establishes the death penalty for murder. The division between man and beast is, according to the Genesis text, that in the image of God he made man. In other words, the divine image serves as the basis for humanity's differentiation from animals and is then the reason why humanity is valued above the rest of creation. In light of this, it does seem to be difficult to merely refer to the divine image as an accidental quality. As the Genesis text seems to indicate that this is indeed the very essence of man. This is precisely what differentiates him from the rest of creation. In other words, what can be said of original righteousness, such as the fact that it is accidental uh, to human nature, it is non-universal, the same principles cannot always be applied to the Imago Dei. We have to take the, ten the Genesis text seriously. This is also apparent in the James text, which is most likely a reference to the Genesis text, where he, again, argues that the basis for human value is in the image of God, which is why he says that using your mouth to curse another man is wrong. It's wrong precisely in that humanity has value as he is in the image of God. So, we now see the, the dilemma here and the need for some expansion upon this idea of vestiges, and now we move to Revere Franklin Widener. Now, Revere Franklin Widener, his years are 1851 to 1915, was one of the most prolific authors within American Lutheranism during his lifetime, writing on biblical theology, Greek exegetical theology, ethics, dogmatic theology, and many other areas as, as well. Widener had a significant grasp on nearly every area of theological study. His most ambitious project was his proposed 12-volume studies in dogmatics, which would cover every area of dogmatic theology, just like the old 17th century Lutheran Orthodox works did. With Widener's untimely death, he was not able to complete the project, leaving four of those volumes unfinished. But our present concern here is one that is complete. This is the third of these eight volumes, which is titled... Anthropology on the Doctrine of Man. Very creative title we have here. All right. One of Widener's last published texts, this book was released in 1912, and it's the culmination of 30 years of reading and teaching on this subject. He had a real passion for the subject of theological anthropology. It is important to note that Widener is not really an innovator in his work, neither in, on this subject nor really any other. His giftings were primarily uh, in synthesizing the work of others. Along with the traditional orthodox texts, Widener cites five more recent, they were recent in his day, uh, authors who impacted his formulation of theological anthropology. Those are Ernst Ludhart, Charles Porterfield Krauth, Adolf von Harless, Julius Mueller, and Franz de Lich. Through the use of each of these authors, Widener addresses the human constitution, the nature of the divine image, and the challenges of philosophical materialism. As much as I'd love to explore all of those things, he'd be here for the rest of the day. So uh, we'll be really looking at his treatment of this question of the Imago Dei in relation to what we saw in, in the 17th century Orthodox. In his treatment of the divine image, the, the image of God in man, Widener begins with a denial of the Roman Catholic division between image and likeness. 
there is a singular sense in which man and woman share in the divine image, according to Widener, because there is no lexical or contextual reason to distinguish between the term Selem and Demuth, image and likeness. The Mosaic account uses these words interchangeably. Along with this denial of twofold division, Widener includes two other rejected approaches to the Imago Dei. First, Widener rejects the idea that the image is in the body of man as God is pure spirit without form. Second, Widener dismisses the view that the divine image consists solely in man's dominion over the animal world. This approach was taken by the Sassinians and has had quite a revival in the modern era, especially among so-called Christian physicalists. To be clear, Widener does not dismiss this altogether as an element of the divine image, but he sees it as a manifestation of the divine image. We can now look at Widener's positive construction of the image of God and man, which extends beyond that, that narrowly moral focus that tends to dominate 17th century orthodoxy. He proposes that this divine image is not bodily at all, but is instead grounded in the spirit of man as God is spirit. It is precisely in the spiritual orientation of humanity that man and woman are distinguished from the animal world. Ehler presents the differentiation from the beasts in two points. First, man and woman are created to be in spiritual communion with God. Second, humanity serves as representatives of God on earth. This image is further defined through five particular points cited from De Lich. First, the image consists primarily of the invisible rather than visible nature of man. It is thus inherently psychological. It is a psychological reality. Second, uh, if it consists in this invisible, this image refers to the soul and spirit of man while referring to the body only in the same sense that it is an, in the sense that it is an organ of soul and spirit. Third, uh, the image refers to human self-consciousness, freedom and spirituality, which are not properties of the animal world. Fourth, post-lapsarian man retains the image of God in some sense, though it is, as he writes, fearfully marred. This remaining trace of the image of God primarily shows itself in two ways. First, the conscience exists all across humanity. Unregenerate men and women still have a sense of right and wrong, even if it is heavily distorted. Second, this universal image shows itself in man's natural belief in God's existence. Even if it is not acknowledged consciously, there are certain intuitive ideas, he says, that testify to God's existence that do remain in the unbelieving heart. The fifth point made here regarding the divine image is that the true image has been lost in the fall, though these remnants do remain. There's this important distinction between the image in some broader sense uh, that we have to maintain and what he calls the true image, which has indeed uh, been lost. But these remnants of the image, Widener citing Delitzsch says this, he says that they are incapable of being lost by humanity, as they are the basis for the dignity of man. This portrayal of the image here does not appear to treat it as accidental to the human nature, but instead it is so tied to the human essence that it is incapable of being separated from it. A final point to be made here is that De Lich, as cited by Widener in a proper Lutheran manner, presents the Imago Dei as thoroughly Christological. Any Imago Dei within human persons is a mere reflection of the perfection of the divine image as is found in the eternal Logos to whom the believer is being gradually uh, conformed. Now for the sake of time, I will just very briefly summarize the next point. Uh, and then get to, to the conclusion here. Uh, Revere Flank and Weider then goes on to uh, speak about a biblical psychology. And speaking about biblical psychology, what Widener is not speaking about is what we usually think of as the discipline of psychology. Uh, but what he's talking about is the inner nature of man and the need for us to understand who man is in our inner being. Now, this, when I say inner being, must it must be understood in its proper context that... Uh, Widener is not defending some kind of Gnostic, anti-materialist uh, approach. He's not saying that at all. He greatly affirms the goodness of the body, but distinguishes between the proper function, purpose of the body, and the soul. Within this, 
he then speaks about the nature of body soul and soul actually body and soul and spirit and what he proposes is a kind of trichotomist type of view but one that is um, maybe a little more uh, nuanced than, than what tri trichotomy would have traditionally been. And I'll read this qu just quickly here on this issue. Uh, is it fair then to refer to Widener as a trichotomist? Not quite. In his explanation of the relevant biblical texts, he contends that in some sense, one must be able to make a distinction between soul and spirit. He rejects, however, that the conclusion that these two things constitute separate essences or elements. To the contrary, he argues that it is a, quote, psychical distinction. Widener affirms that Paul's view of human nature in the final result is certainly dichotomic. In other words, the New Testament authors generally divide man in a twofold manner by his bodily and soulish elements, that including both soul and spirit, and trying to reconcile the dichotomic and trichotomic strains of the biblical text Widener attempts to use some formulations that emphasize both unity and difference between the two invisible elements of man. He just makes some proposals here. For example, he says that one might say that the spirit and soul retain a singular nature but have distinct substances. I'm not compelled to follow Widener's language here as the division between nature and substance seems quite difficult to explain uh, philosophically. But the primary purpose of this spirit-soul distinction in Widener is to explain that there is an element of the human person that has a direct connection to God, what he calls the spirit, that is distinct from the self-consciousness by which one acts in the world. He states that the soul proceeds from the spirit, while the spirit is the highest spiritual power that penetrates all the powers of soul and body. Because of the immediacy of the spirit's relationality to God, the divine works of redemption operate first in the human spirit, where it flows to the soul. The spirit then has a direct relation to God and the body to physical creation. The soul serves here as a mediating force between body and spirit. Widener summarizes the difference between soul and spirit by writing that, the spirit is the inward being of the soul, and the soul is the external nature of the spirit. To use the language of the two kinds of righteousness, the spirit receives the gifts of salvation and the soul extends itself out into the world in love. Now move beyond my discussion of Widener's uh, extensive Trinitarian portrayal of the Imago Dei and the nature of the soul, which is fascinating. Um, but I will move on to the conclusion. All right, where do we go from here? In expositing Widener's ideas here, I am not indicating that he has addressed all of the issues of theological anthropology any more than the 17th century Lutheran Orthodox did. What he does do, however, is give us a model. He sets forth a path in which the convictions of Lutheran Orthodoxy, as grounded in the confessional documents, are not departed from, but expanded upon as more challenges to Christian Orthodoxy arose. In Widener's day, Darwinian materialism had overtaken the academy reporting itself to be a comprehensive worldview which challenged the relevance or necessity of the Christian faith. Widener, rightly in my view, recognized that the physicalist assumptions of the Darwinians simply did not address some of the most fundamental realities of man's inner psychological life, which is why he's focusing on it here, such as consciousness, moral sensibility, and the reality of the will. Widener helps to address the challenge, which has been a continual one in Lutheran history, the relationship between the Imago Dei and fallen humanity. While the Lutheran Orthodox favor the term vestige to speak of the remaining elements uh, of the divine image, often without further elaboration, Widener allows for a clearer solution which affirms two biblical realities. One, that the image is lost to such a degree that it is only regained through regeneration and renovation, and two, that all humans have dignity because of the Imago Dei. The reason he is able to do this is that he expands the image to cover more than original righteousness by also including self-consciousness, freedom, spirituality, and the threefold structure of the human spirit as elements of this image. By recognizing that these things remain in unregenerate humanity, Widener is by no means softening the impact of the fall. Sin has had such a profound effect upon the human race that what is left is mere traces. Nevertheless, even in a deeply marred form, the image of God 
remains in and thereby gives dignity to all people. The challenges to biblical anthropology today are manifold, but there are three in particular which I believe that the church needs to be prepared to answer much more clearly. First, though it is perhaps not as significant a challenge as it was in the last century, mechanistic materialism still has significant sway within many fields of science. Against strict physicalism, robust theological anthropology must strengthen its proclamation of and reasons to affirm the inner life of man in the realms of self-consciousness, will, and thought. See that Trinitarian language there. Second, an existentialist obsession with self-creation and the inner self has pitted feeling against nature. This modern-day Gnosticism identifies humans solely with their interior life of feeling to the neglect of biological, ethical, or theological reality. Without falling back into some kind of pseudo-Christian physicalism, it is essential to affirm the goodness of bodily life and the intimate relation between the inner and outer self. The third challenge is that of the post-structuralists and post-Marxists, whose account of identity denies that there is any objective human nature at all. Instead, they contend that humans, just like everything else, are socially determined. This approach allows for no boundaries within human nature, as there is no nature. And this, thus, is the basis for the horrific destructive medical procedures that we are seeing today. If there are no boundaries to humanity or what a human is, then we can destroy and distort it in any way that we want, creating abhorrent ethical actions that one could have hardly imagined even in Widener's day. Without focusing on a clear definition of human nature, these issues cannot be rightly confronted. So I end this paper here not with a clearly formulated theological anthropology that addresses each of these issues. This, of course, being a possibility in a paper of this size. But instead, I conclude with a call to action. As we heard John Calvin before, and I don't know what it means to cite Calvin twice in a Lutheran panel. I apologize for doing this to you. Uh, but there is something right about his understanding of the knowledge of man and knowledge of God being interconnected. And there is a reality, if, if our culture and our world does not understand who man is, we certainly cannot understand man's need or how he could possibly relate to God. And so it's a necessity, an absolute necessity, to understand what we mean by human nature. If we have no clear idea of what humans are, we cannot rightly communicate the nature of our need that the law points out to us and what the gospel shows us in God's act of redemption in Christ. As both the academy and our popular culture continue to descend into what can be called no less than absolute chaos regarding human nature, the subject of theological anthropology will arise as perhaps a more pressing need than ever before. May God provide us with a way forward that is faithful to his word and relevant to these challenges today. Thank you.